I mean, if I could start by talking about the difference between a song and a song for a musical, I think the yeah. context is the... I, was, I think in one word, it's story. Yeah. Hello, and welcome to the Strong Writing Podcast, where we work our songwriting muscles together. My guests today are Linda Hildenen and Colby Michaud. Linda and Colby are a songwriting team working under the name Linco Media, and they specialize in musicals. Their short film, Queen of Hearts, won Best Music in the Main Film Association's uh, Winter Film Challenge, which is a 72-hour film festival. And they've just started releasing a six-episode weekly podcast musical called uh, Once in a Lifetime that you should def definitely check out. It's very exciting. Uh, Linda and Colby are here to discuss their songwriting process and why they chose to write musicals. Now, this topic is, of course, near and dear to my heart since uh, uh, I've spent years in the theater writing music. So we might just geek out a little over musicals. So be warned. Uh, Linda and Colby also share some great tips for songwriters who want to get into writing musicals. So make sure that you uh, listen to the very end. Now, before we get into my conversation with Linda and Colby, I want to tell you about the, today's sponsor, which is the Indie Bible. If you are an independent artist, you need to be putting your best foot forward and being proactive in your music career. You, you need to be building an awareness of your music through radio airplay, reviews, interviews, and features, and so on. And the Indie Bible will help you build your brand with contact information for over 7,000 radio stations, music blogs, and music magazines that want to hear your story and showcase your music. Listings are from the United States, Canada, the UK, Europe, Australia, Asia, and everywhere else. If you are ready to start reaching out and getting some ears on your music, visit strongwriting.net slash bundle to get instant access to the best deal on the Indie Bible Ultimate Bundle today. If you're new here, make sure you subscribe to the show and don't forget to leave comments and reviews wherever you are uh, watching or listening to this. That really helps me to reach more people and I really appreciate it. If you are serious about your songwriting and want to take the next step on your journey, you will find great free resources for songwriters uh, on my website, strongwriting.net. Uh, there's some great content there that's going to help you be more confident, productive, and successful as a songwriter and a musician. And that's also where you'll find the show notes for each episode. All right. So uh, without further ado, let's get into my conversation with Linda and Colby. Here we go. Okay. Uh, Linda Hildenen and uh, Colby Michaud, welcome to the Strong Writing Podcast. Thank you so much. It's Thank a pleasure to be us. here. Yes. Um, so uh, before I, I get into like the meat of the matter, because uh, I know you, we're going to talk about musicals and those are near and dear to my heart. And so I, I, I can't wait. But I want to start by just asking you, you know, where, where you're from, what do you what your musical journey has been and and so on. So, uh, yeah, tell me everything. Would you like to start? I can start. I can try to keep it short. I, I'm a don't no, just no. go long. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, we've got we've got, <laughs> we've got time. hours. We yeah. got hours and hours, <laughs> or an hour as it were. Um, yeah. So my father was in the air force. Um, so I'm a military kid, and it wasn't until so we moved around a lot, and it wasn't until eighth grade where uh, I was faced with a choice. I had to take, I had one class to choose and it was either going to be art class or band. And at that point in my life, I had never played an instrument other than the recorder, which is like most kids play the recorder at some point. Terrible. Um, yeah, but it's the worst. I figured I was, I was not an artist either. I was not, I could not draw or, or paint. So I, I thought, well, I could probably bang on a drum. Okay. And uh, luckily, so I chose band, and luckily the band director was actually a percussionist. So I got, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one lessons from a really experienced drummer for free, basically, and learned the techniques of how to how to play the snare drum in the marching band, and I just kind of 
from that point, I was always involved in my school's bands or multiple bands within school. Um, and then it wasn't until high school where I, I started kind of self teaching myself piano. And I learned, um, that if you play a sequence of notes <laughs> at diff or different keys at different times at different durations, you can create cool sounding melodies. And that's, that was sort of the start of my composing. That's a really important tip for your listeners. If they want to know how to write songs, you can <laughs> yeah. put different notes together yeah, at different yeah, yeah. durations, and that makes uh, mm -hmm. that makes melodies. Yeah. I think that's an important yeah. one. Just yeah. randomly just hit the different keys. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I actually I I think that's uh that's exactly how I wrote my I still remember the first line of music that I wrote when I don't know, I was um eight or something and we got wow. a piano in the house for the first time and i was just playing around and again you know just pressing the different keys you know oh, yeah seeing the sounds that they make and then oh you know i realized oh hey this is i created a thing so you know it is the first time you you figured that out it is kind of a revelation like Oh wow! I have the power to make something using this instrument, just by pressing different things for different lengths of time. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. I think that right, was. I'm sorry. I no, no. That's wrong. That's no, okay. No. It was um, a key part of this too. Was that my teacher in high school or my band teacher, John Neal, um, is an amazing pianist, and he would let me hang out after school and play his piano he would sometimes he would play me pieces of music that he loved and i was just so inspired by that um yeah oh he was also the guy that told me uh the phrase music is what feelings sound like and oh, i like really that. especially recently really taking that to heart because it music is my my form of expression by far yeah. Awesome. Absolutely. So I have a, I mean, I have a fairly different journey um, because I grew up in a very music, well, I don't want to say very musical household, but my father was very musical. So um, my father was, I, I need to be closer. Mm -hmm. My father was uh, a guitarist and a singer and um, he didn't really write his own stuff. And but what's interesting about him is that he never... I, I'm I'm just skipping all over the place here. I, I well, I haven't skipped all over the place. I just started, but but the point is, my father was balancing my whole life his day job, where he, uh, you know, went to a job that he didn't really care that much about, and then he would come home, and then he would have these gigs playing at restaurants or uh, bars, or um, a lot of times like old folks' homes or whatever. And right. so my whole – my memory of my whole life is just watching my father who was – he didn't hate his job. He just didn't love it. And watching him go from being somebody who you know, had no real interest in what he was doing on a day-to-day -day basis to finding the time to pursue his passion. And I think about that more and more now because what Colby and I are doing is very much not my day job. Um, and it's incredibly hard being somebody who has a day job and children and just a hundred thousand things to juggle and finding the time to do this. But what I found is that I cannot not do it. I just, yeah. yeah. So um, I think for me, what I always say is that the best reason to do something is when you can't not do it. And I can't not make music basically. Um, but I don't, one of the reasons that Colby and I make such a nice pairing uh, is I, I've been musical my whole life. When you were speaking just a few moments ago about remembering the first time you created a melody by hitting the piano. We didn't have a piano in my home growing up and my father um, played the guitar, but it was a little more inscrutable. Like you couldn't just pick it up and hit things and come upon something as naturally. But I definitely would just like sing to myself and my whole life, I definitely still remember this song, I randomly on the street, I was walking down the street, there was a squirrel running. I know where I was. 
I know everything. It's very easy for me to associate songs with where I was when I wrote them or thought about them. I was rocking on a street near my house. There was a squirrel about 100 feet in front of me, and I started singing. And it was, Mr. Squirrel, come over here, please. I want you to be my friend. Mr. Squirrel, come over here, please. I promise the fun will not end. And it was that exact melody. And I have remembered it my entire life. Like, and it's not. How old are you? I was eight ish, seven or eight, six. I don't know. Like, I was, I think I was walking alone, but I was just walking to the playground near my house. So, like, eight is roughly the age. And I, like, I, and I remember what happened is it became my little, the squirrel kind of stopped and looked at me and I was able to get closer (laughs) to it than I ever had. So it became this thing that every time I saw a squirrel, I would sing it to the squirrel. And I don't know. It's just, it's the, it is what I credit as being the first song I ever wrote. Um, but I don't you captured like, its attention. I did. You're like the, the Pied Piper. Attention. I know. Yeah. Like the squirrel Pied Piper. I could have gone into a very different direction. Like right now, yeah. I could have a musical extermination business that, yeah. uh, or, well, I mean, I guess I wouldn't exterminate them. I would just lure them, lure them to a happy place. Yeah. I could have a, a musical rodent relocation yeah, business. Yeah. We should, if this doesn't work out for us, let's just become musical rodent relocators. Okay. It's probably more profitable, <laughs> frankly. Um, but regardless, uh, but I can't sing or I couldn't sing. And um, or my my older sister made a habit of telling me I couldn't sing. She used to tell me I was uh, tone deaf. And like as recently as like a few years ago, she would still tell me I was tone deaf, um, which I'm I'm demonstrably not tone deaf that's not i don't think it means what she thinks it means but either way um i was my sister sort of telling me i was tone deaf was a really big part of why i didn't really pursue music for myself and then i did also join band uh in fifth grade and um i had a great band teacher from from sixth grade on named mr judd um who i just have to shout out if we're talking about our musical histories or whatever but it was just always this thing and i i really got more into lyrics. Um, But for me, writing lyrics always came with writing melodies because they are one and the same. I I don't know. Like I can't write lyrics without writing melodies for them, which is why I never really had a successful music writing or any otherwise writing partnership until I met Colby. Um, And when I met him, there was this instant ability for me to write lyrics to his music in a way that, I hadn't experienced with anybody else before Um, because, you know, when, when Colby is saying, what did you say that music is very much your language or whatever? I think the thing that's really fascinating about the way he and I work together is that it's when he plays a song, I am able to understand what he's saying with a great deal of specificity. It's not just like, oh, that's a sad one. Like I have a very (laughs) clear sense of, okay, this is what's going on for you. Um, And I've never really had that form of communication with anybody else before. So um, I've been writing all my life and I I really have focused more on words, but um, I did have a briefly, and I mean, I guess sort of still, me and my husband had a little musical uh duet duo called scrum girl but uh it was very frustrating for me because we did it a lot before we had children then we had children and trying to get him to do it was this this like herculean task like he did not he he, you know he had other things that he wanted to be doing and i'm like i don't know if you know this i am not okay if i'm not being creative like you you're not okay if the house isn't clean i'm not okay if we're not actively making music and so there was a lot of tension around that before I eventually met Colby and sort of poured a lot more of my creative energies into this, uh, this partnership. So, um, that's a, that was a, it's kind of the arc of it. It goes from a squirrel to him basically. Yeah. Yeah. So many things in my life do. Yeah. Squirrel. (laughs) There you go. And and how long have you been working together? Five and a half years. Yeah. Roughly. Yeah. Five years. Five and a half. Nice. Five and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, because July would be six years, right? August eighth or August. Uh, sorry, August. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> uh, July. We well, we met in yeah. June or so. Okay, of that that's, year. Yeah, yeah. So, well, let's get this straight. Um, but but um, so 
have you have you your collaboration uh always been about like uh, like a, a, a musicals or has it just been music and then uh because i know that you you've done musicals and things like that uh, but is it is it is it just music in general or have you focused on music musicals since you started working together it's actually more than that we our first i would say official project was working on a what was at the time a short film i had written um Sort and of. he had sort of written it. Yeah. Yeah. It was like a 30 page script and um, it was, it wasn't intended to be a collaboration, but I wanted her to read it because she was a writer and she proceeded to tell me that it was really not that great. <laughs> and if I come on board, I can help expand it and fill all these holes. And, and so we went down that path and then we made a, what ended up being like a 90 minute film. Um, okay. And that is not currently available for public consumption, right. just for the record. It never fully got edited, but yeah. it does exist. It's still in the works. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not a musical, so we lost interest. But our, yeah. um, you know, from the start, I was the, the first w w the first minutes that we knew each other, we were I was at a piano. Yeah. And uh, so it was always going to be we always wanted to work together on musicals. So, I mean, I feel like I have a much more specific recounting of the story. <laughs> Maybe, um, probably. <laughs> I was working in marketing at a time. I will keep it, I will keep it briefish, but I was working at mark in marketing at the time at a, uh, a senior living community. And, um, I had this, this boss who I will, I, his name is David and he had met Colby through some other connection. And he's like, I want to bring him on to do some video work for us. Cause uh, Colby owns a, a video production company called Praxis Productions. And so Colby came in and it was my job to, uh, sh be the liaise with him. And the first thing I did was I showed him around the senior living community and it's this beautiful place. And there are a lot of pianos like scattered throughout so that the residents can just like, it's, you know, it's not like a, it's not like a nursing home. Like it's a, it's a place for vibrant older people. Um, and well, you are in marketing. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, I, I worked there for a long time. Um, and I remember, it was like when we met, we very, very instantly had chemistry to the point where it was like, we're at, we're at a, a table and it's like my bosses that I've all known for whatever. And Colby's there and people keep saying things and Colby and I just like keep making like eye contact and cracking up because like we already have private jokes and we haven't even been in a room alone yet. Um, and then I start touring him around the facility and, and like, I, I remember thinking like, what, what, this guy's great. Like he's, 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 he's funny and he's smart and blah, blah, blah. And then he's like, that's, that's a piano. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, can I touch it? And I'm like, dude, if you're like in my mind, I'm like, he can play the <laughs> piano on top of all of this. Like what, what is happening? So he sits down and he starts playing the piano. I'm like, Oh, he can, he can play the piano. Like this isn't just like a casual <laughs> guy who's just like, Oh, I'm going to sit down and impress you or whatever. Like this is a guy who actually sat down and impressed me. I am very challenging to impress. Um, and so he's playing the piano and I think it was like the first day that you asked me like, you asked me if I was musical and all. And I was like, yeah, I, I write music. And he's like, do you write lyrics at all? And I'm like, yeah, I, I write lyrics sometimes. And he's like, well, are you any good? And I believe my response <laughs> was, well, I'm a woman. I'm not allowed to admit to being good. And he just, <laughs> he just stared at me for a second. I'm like, yes, I'm very good at it. And he's like, okay. And then we moved from one piano to another later in the tour. And you started writing, you started just playing the song. And he's like, write lyrics to this. I'm like, oh, right now. That's what you want me to do it right now. And then my boss walked in and there's this recording of Mark coming in listening as you're just playing a song. And he's like, what's this song? And I'm like, he's writing it right now. And he's like, what are you talking about? Oh yeah, about? that's right. Yeah, there's a recording of that. You writing the song. And so then I took the recording home and I wrote these lyrics to him. And the reason I say August 8th is how long we've been working together because I... I don't know when, ex like, I don't know exactly when this happened, but b by the time I emailed him back the lyrics and you took a few days to respond, he finally read the lyrics and he texted me this and he said, our partnership has officially begun. And so I looked at my, my, and I had known him for like, I don't know, maybe three weeks at this point. And I just looked at my calendar. I'm like, okay, Siri added, add a reminder, August 8th, that it's our anniversary. And 
like as a joke, like uh, just so I could think back to what was happening a year ago when it came out. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, it didn't, it became not a joke. Um, and uh, we worked on things here and, you know, things here and there, but it wasn't until we, the fourth anniversary, August 4th of four years later was when we uh, went public with Linco Media, which is our partnership. Um, and then the fifth anniversary, I forced him to watch the last five years, which is a beautiful <laughs> musical he had never seen before. Um, and uh, I don't, yeah, it's just, it's interesting how I didn't really believe in fate or whatever, but this is, this is what I'm meant to be doing. And uh, it's, it's been a pretty incredible journey for the last five and a half years. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sounds like it. So tell me about queen of hearts. Oh, queen of hearts. Queen of hearts. Um, that is something that actually hasn't been on our minds recently. Um, (laughs) we, we've been in a, uh, you know, trying to get our, our musical launched, which we have successfully, but the the podcast, the podcast, but yeah, um, we're going to talk about that later. Oh yeah. Oh, for sure. But so queen of hearts was a nice kind of, um, respite. Yeah. It was a good break from what we were doing with the, with the musical and, here in Maine, we had there's a, a nonprofit organization that supports uh, local filmmakers called Maine Film Association, and they were hosting the first ever um, 72 hour film challenge, in which um, 20 teams come together on one weekend in February during the winter. Yes, very, very cold. Winter, it was called the the main winter film. The cha- winter film. Winter challenge. film. That's challenge. very important because it was not warm. No, no, no. <laughs> it was awful. And uh, and so every every team individually will go up and draw out of a hat their a, a genre, a film genre. Well, two genres. Or you get yeah, you have to pick one of two. And we had gone in to this with the plan that no matter what genre we chose, we were going to make it into a musical. Mm -hmm. And so if we chose sci-fi or horror, it was going to be a a sci-fi musical or a horror musical. And coincidentally, we actually drew musical (laughs) and um, romantic comedy or romance. And I decided to put back the musical and we He was instructed to put back musical. Well, no, I mean, we, I consulted you. Yes, you consulted me. Yes, that's true. <laughs> I mean, we could have just taken musical. but the, the plan was to throw whoever else got musical under the bus because we knew they weren't going to be able to do it as well as we would. So we figured <laughs> we were going to leave that because every, like every, every one of the slips had to be taken. And so if we put musical back, right. then... Well, I also just really wanted to have romance or rom-com as a genre. Well, I think... And the other thing was that we... we we also very much wanted a genre that wasn't musical because we knew we would spend so much time sitting in a room trying to decide what to do with musical. If we had musical, because that, that we were going to do that no matter what. So we're like, we need something that narrows it down. Yeah. You need need Um, constraints. And so the constraints of uh, a specific genre, love story or romantic comedy, right? It was romance or rom-com. Was it romance? It was called romance. Okay. That's okay. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So Everybody else chose theirs and everyone else has, you know, a different genre. But every every team had the same prompts, which were like you had to use this prop. You had to somehow incorporate a prop and you could use it sparingly or, you know, it could be really str- uh, strong part of the story. The prop for this one was playing a cards. deck of playing cards. And it so it didn't have to be a deck. It could just be playing. Oh, it didn't have to be a deck. No, it didn't have to be a full okay. deck. So we actually spent after everyone left the meeting and everyone sort of off to the races, we spent a good three or four hours just trying to come up with a concept around or maybe longer. A lot longer. <laughs> Remember we, um, we didn't so yeah, we didn't memory? sleep that entire weekend no, at all. Barely. Um, but yeah. we were, you know, everyone else is going out and, and writing a script for their film trying to figure out where they're going to film it. We had to do all of that. Plus we had to write a musical before hand. So we had to figure out what the the concept was and then write the script and the songs sort of 
and in we had tandem to record with, the music. Like we we had this whole then, extra step of recording the music separately before we could even start filming. Not just record yeah. it, but we had to like teach the music to right. the actors. Yeah, it's not and just they a had to learn of memorizing it. a script. They also have to know the songs. Yeah, and, yeah. And so we ended up not having. Um, you know, most people had filmed their stuff. Were completed filming by the end of Saturday. We hadn't even. We had barely we one scene filmed anything going into Saturday. <laughs> and so 90% of the film was shot on Sunday and edited within like three hours or yeah, something so right we, up to the deadline. We got, we got our assignment eight, 8 PM Thursday, which means we had, you know, 8 PM to uh-huh. all of the Friday, all of Saturday and until 8 PM Sunday. And yeah, like you said, right. we, we had filmed one scene as of Saturday night, maybe two. Was it two? One. I think it was one scene as of Saturday night. Yeah. Um, which means we had to film every, and we had the, we had, we recorded the music Saturday morning, um, Friday morning. When did we record the music? Saturday morning. Saturday morning. What the hell did we do on Friday? We were just, we, we continued just writing and rehearsing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, we went into Sunday and we recorded everything on Sunday and, um, film. I want like, it's a songwriting podcast, so we should stop a little and talk a little bit more about <laughs> the writing process because it was a, it was oh, a yeah. bananas writing process. So we're sitting here and we're just like, okay, we got these cards. And I remember there was this one, like we lost and this is one of my happiest memories of us. But at some point I was like, have you ever, have you ever played the, have you ever played the game memory and he's like i've never played the game memory and colby has a terrible memory as a general rule i actually um, have played it he has played it but he couldn't remember couldn't that remember it was remember called was memory called. <laughs> <Remember him. laughs> yeah. okay. um great Irony. and i was like well maybe we could write a musical about this like we like the idea that we were playing with was that we could write a musical about a card game and so we started playing memory and i had to like we were you, you know i for the listeners who may not know memory is a game where you put all 52 cards down face down and then you have to slowly match them like they're spread out across the table and you pick right. two cards at a time and uh you if you get a match you keep them or whatever and, and so you i'm can continue and you continue yeah turn. if you if you yeah. yeah and so if you keep getting matches you can keep going or whatever but we're sitting there and we're so invested in it and emotionally invested but at some point we just look up at each other and we're like this isn't something you could write a musical about. Like this is not a fast and furious card game <laughs> that we can write some sort of musical. But we finished the game nevertheless. I won Col- by Colby the way. Colby definitely beat me. Like a lot by a lot. By a lot, yeah. Um, which was which was upsetting. Um, but mm-hmm. we lost I think we lost a good hour and a half of our 72 hour film festival just playing a memory. Um Yeah, probably. It didn't, and uh, you know, maybe one day we will but find sometimes, a way to write I mean, a musical part, about it. I think that was important that we were doing that because up until that point we were obviously already exhausted Mm -hmm. and stressed out and we were trying to force these ideas into our heads and then we're like you know what let's just take a break and play a game real quick and i think because we played the game it sort of reset yeah we were able to then because right after that game finished how did that how did the actual concept come uh i remember part of it so i remember Oh, somewhere along the line, I thought of the idea of found playing card decks. Are you familiar uh, at all with the idea oh, of yeah. a found playing card deck? No. Okay. Well, there are certain people. It's a kind of a hobby where they, particularly if they live in cities, which we very much don't, but um, that they will, like if they see a playing card on the street, they'll pick it up and they will just keep doing this until they collect an entire deck of cards like and they're mismatched oh. cards right but right. there are people that make a hobby out of trying to collect an entire deck and of course it starts out easy cuz you're unlikely to have whatever you just picked up but towards the end it gets very exhausting because you know you need one <laughs> the last chances card of right? that yeah and so um so I was like well that that's kind of interesting we could do something with that and then he somewhere along the line, you said something about like, let's think about other things that a playing card could do. And you said the thing about you might find a card folded up supporting a table. Oh yeah. And I just sort of sort of mar- started yeah, right. marrying that. And I was like, well, what would happen if it was supporting a table and you took it out because you were looking for it and you, you hit the table and somebody was sitting at it. Mm-hmm. And so somewhere along the way, we started to form this idea of sort of a meet cute where this guy who's so obsessed with, finding these playing cards that he keeps sort of doing inconsiderate things. Um, 
And what happens is the first thing he finds is the the spade, the four card 51. Just one more and I'm finally done. He finds um, he finds a, 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 spa- a four of spades in the first song. And we learn that the last card he needs is the queen of hearts. And so this guy being somebody who feels strongly about um, fate and, and the fact that he's not going to be complete until he finds love or whatever decides that this is sort of, sort of metaphor for the fact that his life will be complete when he finds the queen of hearts, because that's going to, that's going to guide him to finding the love of his life. Right. And it's, it's delusional, but that's the idea is that, you know, we, we do a lot with characters who have these sort of high minded beliefs that they're going to be um, completed by love which um, is something that a lot of people I think feel, I guess I'm, I'm going to keep going now. Um, (laughs) Sorry. No. Uh, So yeah, we do a lot of, we we do a lot with that certainly. Um, So the idea is that this character is believing, you know, believes that once he finds the queen of hearts, that that's going to mean something really, really uh, important in his life. And it's going to lead him to a bigger discovery or whatever. Um, And so from there, Uh, but then he like, he's so, he's like singing his song about having found it. And, you know, I will find the true meaning of love when I'm blessed by the dealer above and he's singing. And then he just hits into this woman and spills her coffee. And Hmm. I don't want to give away the whole plot, but the point is he just keeps, um, bumping into this woman. Uh, and help me out here i'm I'm having i'm struggling he keeps bumping into this woman and it, what, what we're doing is we're building this expectation that it's a fairly typical meet cute uh romantic comedy where two people start out hating each other and then they fall in love but then we very much subverted that expectation because i i don't i, I prefer to subvert expectations whenever possible basically of and so by the time he, he does end up finding the queen of hearts and i i don't want to give it away but yeah. I, I don't know how much do we want to give away here basically you find out that the final card he needs is a card that's very important to her personal history and they don't fall in love by any means but it is a card that means a lot to her definition of love and watching her react to that gives him this he's able to find what he needs which is actually a less self-centered view of the world like he thinks what he needs in order to find love is romance but the reality is what he needs to find love is consideration for Mm. human beings and the willingness to acknowledge that you can Love can happen every day. Love can happen by being kind to a stranger and and helping somebody through something. And so that's it ends up taking a turn. And we ended up writing um, the only part of the musical we had at all was this. I think like two lines, you know, previous to the seventy two hours was this two lines of music that Colby had been whittling around with that he really enjoyed, and um, we ended up making that the sort of the emotional that song into the emotional climax of the film. Um, but do you remember how, cause we, uh, we were sitting at a sort of like a, a big table, like a, our conference table. And then after we played the card game, we moved into my office where I could sit down at, a, um, my music workstation basically, and start trying to figure out these songs. Um, and typically it's either I will come up with a tune and a melody and then send it to Linda and she'll put her lyrics to it or vice versa. Mm -hmm. She'll send me lyrics and then I have to come up with a melody, but we didn't have the luxury of time. So we had to write these, both the lyrics and the melody at the same time in the same room. And I just remember that I'm sitting there, you know, at my keyboard trying to come up with musical ideas. And I had, (laughs) I had Google docs open, which is her doc shared with me so I could see what she was doing in real time behind me. Yeah. And I, I don't remember what the first, there was a hook. There was a moment where we're like, okay, this is the, yeah, I don't, we hooked onto some, some line and I can't remember exactly what it was. It was I the mean, first line, I think. Uh, oh my God, can it really yeah. be true? All this time. And it's actually you, the spade, the four. Yeah. Um, I, my, what I remember about the process is that the the second song, the, the first song is a very like typical upbeat musical thing. And so we were able to write that together fairly efficiently. But the second song is, again, it, we are subverting the expectations of the typical, um, what can I say here? A typical rom-com. rom-com. Or- and so uh, 
so the second song is incredibly sad. And I remember very much being like, okay, you keep working on this first song. I have to go shut myself in your office and think of the saddest things I can imagine and make yeah. them into lyrics. So he's outside and he's just like, ba, 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 and I'm just sitting there like, okay, this is what's okay. This is like, cause like I, uh, we will be this, this movie we, we're going to be um, editing together a longer version because we, we went out of our way to, we, it could only be um, eight, eight minutes, minutes was long. the cutoff. So we recorded some right. extra stuff because we knew it wasn't that wasn't going to be long enough to tell the story. So sometime in that seventy two hours, we actually recorded stuff for a longer version. Um, so we are going to be editing together as soon as we're done with this podcast. We're going to be editing together a longer version and then submitting to uh, film festivals. Not your podcast, by the way. Not your. Uh, <laughs> right. Not no, yeah, no, I got it. I, got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just want to. I just want to interject yeah. that. Oh, I, um, we've been talking forever. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. That's that's good. Um, but I just uh, um, uh, what I've been thinking while you've been telling this story uh, is that I'm so big on challenges and challenging yourself mm -hmm. and. And, uh, you know, mm. whether that's, uh, you know, I'm going to write a song every day for a month or, yeah. or I'm going to I'm gonna write nonstop for 24 hours or whatever. And this sounds like a fantastic challenge. Uh, it really and, was. And it yeah. kind of brings me to a, a question because it's very much, you know, you I, I work, I like working from songwriting prompts, you know, whenever I'm uh, anything to, to again, constrain myself and and you know make sure that i'm not you know all over the place uh, or mm -hmm. whatever uh and and that sort of was very much what you it sounds like you were doing but uh, what's the how and i'm asking you this and i i sort of know the answer for me because i've done a lot of it but what's the difference between just writing a song and writing a song for a musical Hmm. Well, for me, I mean, I think – so, I mean, if I could start by talking about the difference between a song and a song for a musical, I think the yeah. context is the – I, was, I yeah. think in one word, it's story. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, because when you write a song, you are giving somebody an, a, you are giving somebody a piece of a puzzle that they can fit into their own life. Right? right. They can they can figure out and, – and, and they absolutely can with musical songs too, but – um mm -hmm. you're giving them something that they're going to make their own and when 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 a singer sings the word you everybody's picturing somebody different right um and when a singer and 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 i think a lot of the times that's why the most popular songs are so like vague like almost like almost disgustingly vague sometimes like so like just mass appeal you know um whereas in a musical you've created the context of the characters and so you can really dive deep into it, some specifics yeah in a musical way that i think it really touches people musical songs exist in a specific world where yeah. other songs are exist in the world that you wanted to I, I think what's really important about that is that even though a pop song is going to work in generalities and generalities can very very easily appeal to the masses um there's some phrase and I'm not going to get it right and I don't even know who said it but it's like in the specific you find the the broad or something like that like there is a deeper truth to be found I think particularly for people who maybe are slightly more on the intellectual side that when we have a character so in Queen of Hearts there's this line where she says he used to kiss my eyebrows uh, my eyelids while I laid in bed that's not something people specifically understand, but they understand the feeling that she is evoking and they can, they can then go in and think about their own specific thing yeah. that, that right. works with that. And so I, as a songwriter, I really love diving into specifics and diving into these things that these very specific details evoke these more deep emotions that can then be brought into people's stories um mm -hmm. but i think you know i think you can i think you can find a deeper truth working with musicals because you can you could find yourself in a whole character instead of just finding yourself in the word you that a pop singer saying i think i i love i love what you said about context i think that's the key word probably because to me story 
every song, even so- instrumental pieces of music, are to me uh, a narrative thing. They mm-hmm. they all have so- the ones that work uh, all have some sort of journey. And so, like you, you, me, if I listen to uh, instrumental music, I there's some there's some story going on in my head mm-hmm. because humans are we're story driven. We we thrive on stories, and we're we're genetically disposed to wanting there to be some sort of story. Yeah, and so when I'm listening to music. Uh, whether whether the whether there are lyrics that tell a story, or whether it's just a piece of music, or maybe there's the there are words that are just there and they don't particular like like Bohemian Rhapsody. Mm. That's the lyrics mean nothing, absolutely I, nothing. That's right. <laughs> Beelzebub uh, and the and devil I, I, put aside Freddie, for Freddie me. Mercury yeah. even said that once. He said, oh, yeah. "I have no idea what any of that means." Yeah, right. Um, but um, but there. It, Maybe the greatest song we, of all we time. We create by the way. stories. Sorry. Maybe the greatest song of all time. Like absolutely one of my top five favorite songs. Very probably yes. Yeah. Um, but we can, let's not start talking about Queen or we'll be <laughs> yeah, here all not. night. That, that would take um, a while. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but but the difference is that in a musical, there's context to the story that you're telling in the song, mm-hmm. and you can't. I mean, you you can be you can be vague up to a point, you know, um, like you're saying, you know, you kiss my eyelids. That you, I, I assume that's backstory that you don't, as as a viewer, you don't really know what the backstory is, so you're filling in the gaps. But mm-hmm. so you know, it's vague up to a point, but it has to be more grounded than you know. So you have less freedom, and we go, but we get back to being constrained by something. You can't. You can't really uh, do anything. You have to be economical and you have to stay on point. Uh, whereas if you're writing a song, you can take it in any direction you want. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. it has to it has to advance it has to advance the story in a meaningful way. And yeah. and so often it's really I think the stories that we've written so far have been just very, very character driven. They're more character driven than plot heavy. Yeah. Um, and so for us, the, the songs are very much um, a way to express the character. And I think one of the great things about that, I think one of the great things about musicals in general is that you're going to, you're going to like the villain better in a musical than you are in of a typical in a typical movie or 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 theater mm-hmm. experience or whatever, with the exception of Hans Gruber or whatever from Die Hard, who, like, <laughs> generally speaking, villains fall a little flat, but not villains in musicals because they are able to express this really charismatic part of themselves through song. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, I mean, I think, yeah, I think context and character, I think, are the two major, major differences, and they really appeal to me both. Right. Well, I mean, um, you know, I, I, I'm a big Shakespeare buff. I, I love mm-hmm. Shakespeare, and it, and a musical is very much, you know, it, it's obviously derived from opera, and opera is very much the same thing as a Shakespeare drama mm-hmm. or Greek drama, if you want to go further sure. back. And so you have two kinds of scenes. You have a scene that moves the plot forward, or you have a soliloquy where the characters are telling you what they're thinking. Right. And that's the same as a musical. You have story songs, mm-hmm. or you have character songs. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, and and so you need to you need to know. I mean, I think that's why you know. Again, like I said, I love challenges, and I love writing for musicals because. You have to, you have to know exactly whether whether the song you're working on is a character song or a story song, because it's going to change the way you write music, uh, and the way your lyrics have to work. Because it's okay if if you miss something in a character song, but it's not okay if you miss something in a story song, because then you don't know what's happening in the in the musical. That so, is true. Yeah, I, I don't so, think I, I we mean, think I, about it in that context, really. Do you? Do you think about story songs versus character songs? 
Not really, no. No, it just comes to us sort of, but right. It, th- well, well, you know, I I didn't really I didn't really think about it until I was working with a director, and he was like, "Well, you know, this is a story song, so you have mm-hmm. to. We can't, you know, we have to sing slower mm-hmm. so that nobody misses a word. We have to make sure that it's you know. So there are sort of considerations that sure. I hadn't really taken into account, um, and um. You know, it, it's the, I, I just like these sort of uh, things that that you know force you to step out of your comfort zone. I'm I'm all about that, and um, you know, like another thing is that when you're writing for a musical, it's you have to be brutal when it comes to cutting and changing oh, yeah. and revising, uh, and you know, because again, a character song if you need to cut for time, that's the song that's going to, you know, you're going to have to take off. You're going to have to take off a verse. You're going to have to lose the bridge. You're going to have to do all kinds of things. I have written so many songs that I love. And then I just have to gut them because they're too <laughs> long and there's too much, you know, repetition or whatever, which is fine in a, in a pop song. Yeah. But in, but in a musical, you can't do that because, right. you know, there's not, there's no time. Well, and I'll, I'll certainly say that there have been, I've gone to see, when, whenever there's a new original musical playing at some little theater or whatever, I do try to go because I want to see what other people are doing. And you very, and, and it's, it's a, it's an excellent opportunity. Um, you know, one of the best things you could do as a writer is go see things that don't work and figure out why they don't work. And yeah. I'm not going to, I'm not going to call out anything. And I want to make it clear that, um. I haven't seen one in quite a while because of COVID, but before COVID, I saw quite a few. And what you were saying is resonating a lot with me in terms of things that certain musicals did not do right, like um, because they were trying to cram so much story in that they didn't, you know, mm-hmm. you know, one thing that um, my husband and I just rewatched uh, part of Hamilton last night, and he was like, he pr- he 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 paused it right after we watched. Uh, three songs and he's like oh my god the economy of story writing or whatever and i'm like okay yeah but nobody just I, he, he talks in a weird way nobody says that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what lin-manuel does amazingly like he 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 yes. will sit there and he will rewrite the same song and cut it down and cut it down and cut it down to its its purest huh. form that still gets everything you need to get across so that you end up with something that has mm. nothing you can cut off of it and is like yeah, lyrically so incredible dense. and so dense. And he yeah. will, you know, you know, he talks about yeah. when he was making uh, my shot, and he would start out with ten lines that made the point he needed him to make, and then he would try to make it five, and then he would get five lines that made the point he needed to make, and he would try to make it two, and that's why you get these lines that are like achieving like fifteen story points in like, but but doing it with internal rhymes and like incredible like meter and like it's it's phenomenal. It's um, unbelievable. Yeah, and I learned, and and not only that, like the staging as well does it. So, mm-hmm. You know, because uh, I've only seen the the recording, the one on on Disney Disney Plus. But yeah. uh, well, like they're the not coming scene, to Iceland like, anytime soon. I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> um, and I can't afford to go to Broadway to see it, so I'll just do that. Uh, but um, like the scene, I I think the most eye opening scene from your scenes are the King George songs in Hamilton where and, he's and how so? uh, because it, it, it's one actor mm-hmm. not Jonathan moving yes, yes true. Yeah. a genius not moving and commanding an entire auditorium of people just by singing and standing mm-hmm. still or he yeah. might expressions take some steps. Well, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I mean, an expression. incredible physical actor when it comes to his face and his his yeah. like, you know, was, uh, the the moment where he just spits very like yeah. he's just so angry that that that's a decision there is just yeah, yeah, to yeah, let yeah. it all out there, um, and you you got to give it to him. Well, going back to what you said about um, how the staging was is so vital to the story of Hamilton, I think it was. I don't know if this is the case for you, but with um, both Linda and I, I'm sure millions of other people, fans of Hamilton, we listened to the soundtrack for years before we could actually see it. And so when we yeah, saw same. it, 
it was like a completely it's new actually experience. Only a year before I saw it. Oh, okay. Remember how I bought you a <laughs> ticket and then you didn't come? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, it was a completely new experience to see the visual aspect of the, of oh, the yeah. same material. Mm-hmm. Like you get so much more from the story. It's really, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. I do yeah. want to just shout out, since we mentioned Jonathan Groff, and eventually we're going to talk about our, our musical podcast, I, I would be uh, remiss if I did not mention that Jonathan Groff is in uh, one of the formative musical podcasts that have, or podcast music. I I try to say podcast musical because I think that's more specifically what we're talking about. Um, yeah. He's in one of the formative podcast musicals. It's called 36 Questions. It's three episodes. And uh, um those songwriters, I don't know that they had done a lot before that, but they're kind of living the dream because they wrote this this musical and then they somehow got Jonathan Groff to be in it <laughs> because the music was sort of like Sarah bareilles and he like liked huh. Sarah Bareilles. And I was just like, what, one day we're going to write one and we're going to get somebody of that, uh, of that stature to be in it. Um, but uh, everybody out there listening to this, go out and listen to 36 Questions. Um, they were kind enough to respond to several of my emails when I first when we first started writing our podcast musical. So I owe them quite a bit. And so, aren't, uh, didn't they have a Netflix deal now? They do have a Netflix deal wow. now. So they no longer need our yeah. yeah which you know, fingers crossed. Well, but. you know, uh, fantastic. But so this is a perfect time for you to tell me about your. I am fascinated by this. By the way, uh, a, a, a music a podcast musical sounds like my jam so tell me all about it <laughs> okay shall we tell them all about it we can tell them the why the why we why did t- we decide to make a podcast musical okay well the first thing that you need to know is that we had been working on uh, a stage musical and um it just occurred to me that a lot of what you said about what needs to be cut really <laughs> really applies to our stage musical because that's the one where we're going to have to follow a lot of rules podcast musicals we we get to do a lot of what we want to do but when we go back into hopeless we're going to have to do a lot of what he was saying about gutting things um we had been writing a stage musical um and uh we had we had we had just gotten to the point where we were negotiating with with, with a theater to um to let us put it on and we were we were getting ready we were doing the very very and we don't know what we're this doing this is this is january of 2020 it's it's march of 2020 well we had finished writing it in january of 2020 yeah, we, we started finished. talking to theaters locally in okay. february march, march yeah yes and i don't know how it hit iceland but march of 2020 was not a good time to be planning to put on a live theater event in america it nope, turns out nope. Not, and we didn't know that in early March of 2020, but we did know that by April of 2020. So we had just like, we had just put six months worth of effort into writing this musical and we were just ready and raring to go and in, in discussions with the theater and we had no idea how we were going to finance it or anything, but we were, we were working it all out as we went, went along. And then suddenly there was just this little problem and we just didn't quite know how it was going to shake out, whether the theater might be open, but all right, we'll wait it out. We'll wait it out. And then suddenly it's, it's, it's freaking COVID, you know, like, like everything's down and we're like, okay. And so we had actually written the hopeless for a contest uh, put on by the national association of musical theater that we didn't win. But around that same time, national association of musical theater put out this other contest, which was a 15 minute musical contest. And they're like, Hey, everybody's stuck at home. Nobody can leave. Why don't we use this time to be creative, write a 15 minute musical and do it with the, um, you know, just do it from your own home or whatever. And so we made the rule that we were going to do it from like Colby was the only Colby was the only person I saw during COVID at all. It was Colby and my family, and that was it. Um, but so we were we were together a lot at that time. So we um, we wrote a fifteen minute musical at the time. It was three songs, and um, they were the three oh. songs. What do you remember? What the original concept was. The original concept was the Velveteen yeah, Rabbit. Yeah, the Velveteen yeah. Rabbit um, and that adaptation. And that, yeah. So Colby just kept feeding me these musical ideas. And the idea was that I was going to take these these tunes he gave me and like turn them into a musical about the Velveteen Rabbit because I thought it would be like close enough to COVID because it's about disease or whatever, but far enough away that it wasn't too on the money. And I was just like dedicated to that idea. But I just kept sitting down and nothing was coming to me. And then... There was this guy who I had had this on again, off again, like romantic entanglement with who um, 
who just very, very suddenly in the midst of COVID fell in love. And I was not ready for him to be falling in love with somebody. And it hit me very, very hard. I was like, how the hell did he find somebody during COVID? And I needed to process that. And suddenly I was just writing a musical about two people who beat and fall in love during COVID. Um, and I just took all the melodies that Colby had given me and I just made them into this completely different musical without telling you at all. And one day I just showed up yep. here. We were living here at the time. And I just showed up here and I was like, okay, I have good news. And he, he, I was, you're like, what? And I'm like, I have written all the lyrics. I've written the script. It's done. And you're like, awesome. And I'm like, it is not about the Velveteen Rabbit. And I was, you're like, okay. Yeah, because we were actually t- making it more of a children's. It was going to be a children's show. thing. Yeah, because yeah. we we thought there like we thought that would have some potential down yeah. the road. Yeah. Um, but just not suddenly, I just show up with the 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 words for this three song musical about these people who meet during like meet and go on a couple of dates right before right before the lockdowns and the fir- like and my idea was that it was going to start with a song this could be which is this very very uh hopeful beautiful romantic. So- romantic song that would normally naturally feel like it would be at the end of a musical once they've gotten through all their stuff and it's like oh things are going to go well from here on out but then we put that as the first the song. happily ever it's after the happily ever after song but we put it as the first song and then the next mm. thing that happens covid shutdowns <laughs> and so then it goes from there in the three song version it went into never letting go which is the song about um how, not giving like, up. Well, yeah, it's basically both of them. It, from the happy song, it goes into the song about how they're both like horrified about what's going on. Um, they're just they're like the timing is terrible. I'm never going to see you again. But um, I think when it, I, the final chorus, the lyrics are "By the time we're together." Oh wait, no. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, by that the is time it. we're together again. Yeah, but you need we'll the be- flame line. What's oh. the flame line before it? Um. How do we hold on to this flame without getting burned? We're engulfed and insane, but we're never letting go. We're never letting go. By the time we're together again, we'll be embers. But from now until then, we're never letting go. And so it's basically the song where they're acknowledging that they're in this hopeless situation, but coming out of it like they're going to do it. And then the third song is this finale of them. um, And we wrote this thinking, okay, we don't know when this is going to be in time, but when the when the yeah. stay at home orders end, they'll get to get back to like it'll <laughs> the stay at home orders will end and they will run to each other and that'll be the finale. And so we wrote the finale like thinking it thinking that the time frame would make sense and it would be like four or five weeks. Like it was it was just this short right. little thing about how these two people had to spend four <laughs> or five weeks apart. And that and, and and so we, and we had to submit it in April or uh, May May of, May of two, yeah. 2022 and we had no idea that it wasn't going to come true 2020 that's correct yeah. May of 2020 and so uh we didn't win but we're like okay well we feel strongly about this let's do something and this by the way uh, you wouldn't know this, but in the United States at this time, we were when by the time we found out we didn't win, we were headed into summer of 2020 in Maine, which was the state other than Vermont with the lowest infections. Like there was nothing bad happening here. You couldn't go anywhere or whatever, but everybody was healthy. Coronavirus really hadn't, we're pretty far apart from each other in Maine. And so everybody was healthy. So we're like, yeah, Maine seemed to be sort of sheltered from the rest of the country. Until some idiots went to a wedding and then everything went downhill from there. But um, the point is weddings. yeah, Yeah. Yeah. No, there was, there was this one wedding that ended up being like the, the, case zero what do you call it patient, patient zero thing for maine. W- yeah. for maine like maine had maine was having like i don't know 15 infections a week yeah. for for months and nobody was really scared and you were just sort of like we don't know what to do but okay we're fine um and then these people went to a wedding and suddenly we are because nobody has immunity because nobody has it and it's just it went downhill very very fast but right. up until that point we're like well we'll just stage it it'll be fine um and that was that was a st- and then at some point I was like you know what we can't stage this because if we're staging it and we're putting it if we're going to do some pro shot and put it online because Colby has a video production company the rest of, it would be irresponsible to represent that to the rest of the country where things are really really bad so then we came up with the idea of doing a podcast because nobody would have to be together um and then we slowly expanded it from three songs to six this is a relatively 
like there's not that much music in this musical sadly that's that's my one regret is that we don't have more songs right now um but we expanded it from being three songs to six and it became the six episode narrative thing um and there's one song per episode and it's i had to get to know the characters a lot better we ended up gender flipping our male character to I couldn't I could not attach to the the male character. There was something about him that wasn't making sense to me. So I ended up gender flipping him and it became there because we needed there to be another like eventually after a while you would just be like, "Okay, well, let's just hang out and we won't hang out with other people." Like the fact that the fact of COVID wouldn't have kept them apart that long. So one of right. the, the the tricky things we added is that we had a lesbian character and this bisexual character who had never been with a woman before. Um, and she's trying to figure out her sexuality, but she can't physically see the person she's just fallen in love with. And that's a, that's a tricky situation no matter what. So that added a layer. Um, and then it just, it just developed into what it is now. So uh, that's, that's, do you want to say something about once in a lifetime? <laughs> You're all the way over there. I, I mean, Sure, but if he had a piano, you'd be very impressed with him, right? Yeah, now. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I mean th- this sounds this sounds uh, uh, fascinating. And and is it is it out or is it uh, about to come out? Literally, the first episode came out yesterday. Yeah, March twenty ninth. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Yesterday okay. when we were recording this. Yeah. As, yeah, yeah. Well, this is, this will be out in a few days. So yeah. yeah so people okay. can subscribe now and tell them where to find it so they can go and subscribe now and so they won't miss the rest. Well, um, we're on all the major podcast platforms. So wherever you prefer to listen, I'm sure you can find it there. The probably the easiest way to to find it is to search either search Linco Media on Spotify or um, Apple Podcasts, or you can go to Linco, our website, Linco.media, where we have the hyperlinks to to all that. So Linco is spelled L I N C O, uh, because that's uh Linda and Colby. You took I yeah, <laughs> bizarrely, whatever. But you could also, I just launched today, once in a lifetime podcast.com, okay. which goes to a sub page of Linko Media that just has subscription links yeah. or whatever. Because yes. awesome. And I'll put been, I'll put a link to that in the show notes and everything. That's perfect. Uh, Thank you so much. And we please, if you can hear us right now, for the love <laughs> of God, we are not we we have no budget. Like we are <laughs> please please listen to us. We want to do more of this. Like yes. this is my my heartfelt uh my heartfelt ask to all of your listeners. I think they the, I think everybody will. This is uh, this is so exciting. Uh and before we and I I I just I'd love to know because you know you you're musical writers and I love that and I think the world needs more musicals. So for anybody listening, do you have like two or three tips for people who want to write musicals but don't know where to start if you can avoid it don't it's very stressful (laughs) (laughs) that's the that's your tip don't no there's this there's this story of this famous comedian who like like i don't remember exactly which comedian it is it might be maybe jerry seinfeld or something like some name of a comedian that if i said his name you would know it and what he does is that if a comedian Mm -hmm. like a a would-be stand-up comedian asks him to do it he's just like no don't do it whatever you do this is too hard it's like it's not worth it whatever and his thinking is that the people who still go forward and do it anyway despite their hero telling them not to Mm -hmm. those are the ones who can stand up to the rigors of stand-up comedy because it's not an easy way to make a living and i gotta tell you I'm dying right now. Like, this is not easy. Trying to balance this with the rest of my life, I would not recommend to anybody who has an option to do, like, whatever. Like, if you if you are somebody who can go to sleep at night without having written a musical that day, then go to sleep at night without having written a musical that day. But I personally can't. I might have right. some more practical advice. Yes, he has better ideas. Um, yeah, better thank tips. you. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that <laughs> if you're if you're a songwriter, either you're you know you're great at music, and that music just kind of comes naturally to you, or you're um you're maybe you're better at writing lyrics, but you kind of need help with the the music part. I would say collaborate. That is probably the. There's no way that we would be able to do this on our own. A hundred percent not not possible. 
Like neither. I think. I, I think. I think both of us just sort of went through our lives like knowing there was something bigger in us and then not like failing to do it over and over and over again until we met. And the other the other benefit of of having somebody else um, is the accountability because Mm -hmm. it's so easy as a a single uh, a solo artist to just not to do it. Yeah. And I actually remember I was just listening to your uh, the episode I think that just came out before this one where you're talking about setting goals and yeah. um, you also mentioned, was it morning pages or something? There's yep. like a, a journal. Yeah, a guided journal. Like, <laughs> um, It is so easy to get really excited at the beginning of a new project and just pour your heart and soul into it and, and every minute into it. And then at a certain point, it becomes less magical and oh less my God. shiny. <laughs> so much less yep. shiny. And then you just kind of just sits on the shelf mm-hmm. and collects mm-hmm. dust with every other project that you started. Mm-hmm. And it's, that's, it would, it would be probably the same um, if we, (laughs) if we didn't set a, a deadline for the launch and make it public, Mm -hmm. it would not be out right now. Yeah. That's why the 72, like, that's why the 72 hour film festival really, like, and it's what you're saying, you know, you need constraints to make creativity work in a lot of ways. Absolutely. And you mm-hmm. need you need to uh it's it's funny that you mentioned Jerry Seinfeld. Uh one of the big I used to be a comedian. Um mm-hmm. uh, then you I have stopped a comedian being funny. Voice. Uh you know, I lost <laughs> I lost my sense of humor. Okay. Um it was surgically removed. It was a whole thing. But That's anyway, um it was yeah. But um but uh I learned a great lesson from Jerry Seinfeld. Because he 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 told this story once when when he was first starting to make it you know make money and and be a professional comedian, he was sitting in a coffee shop somewhere in New York City, and he was looking out the window and there were construction workers on the other side of the street. Uh, they were showing up for work and they were you know getting their coffee and starting their work day, and he said you know those guys make a lot less money than I do, and their work is a lot harder, and they show up every single day. Mm-hmm. And if I'm serious about what I'm doing, I need to show up for work every single day. So he started to show up for work every day and sit down and write jokes like on the clock because that was his job now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is the biggest lesson I've ever learned as an artist, regardless of whether I'm writing songs or you know I've written uh, fiction as well and I've 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 done different things. Is you have to be accountable to yourself and you have to show up and do the work. And it's, and you're right. It's so great to have somebody else to collaborate with, to be accountable to, because it's much easier to fail yourself than it is to fail other people. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, And so, so I, I love that. And I think that's the biggest thing we can do for each other as songwriters is to, to offer each other support and, and collaborate or just hold each other accountable uh, or whatever it is. And that's a big part of the reason why I love connecting with people like you and uh, all the other people that I get on this show and and my clients that I work with, uh, my songwriting, uh, in my songwriting coaching and, and all of that is just because I think getting more songs out into the world makes the world a better place. Getting more musicals out makes the world a better place. So the more we can do for each other and stick together as songwriters and as artists, the you know the better the world's going to be, right? Sure, and that's my goal. Yeah. yeah. Well, now yeah. we last words so before we say goodbye. To <laughs> I want to make it clear. I think that there are plenty. Like the thing is, I don't think you're ever going to have a, a dearth of people who are coming to you for songwriting coaching. But by the time they're willing to pay for help by the time they're willing to 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 take the steps they need to do those are people who have to do it and so that's yeah. like i'm 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 saying yeah, don't yeah. don't do it if you can you you can say that those the construction workers have an easier job but what they have or have a harder job but what they have is a harder physical job but i got to tell you the amount of times i've 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 yearned to have a job where i can go and work hard all day and then turn my brain off at yeah. night like oh, yeah. you're we are all paying for 
you know, yeah, we can do our jobs maybe in a cafe drinking coffee or whatever, but we're we're gonna be up at night trying to figure out yeah. how to be better. You know, it's a twenty four hour day job. Yeah. To be clear, I'm going back to what a, a previous guest, Billy Nomad, said. I asked him, "Can anybody learn to write a song?" And I get asked this all the time. Sure. And my answer has sort of been yes, but he said no. Okay. And his point was that if you want to learn to write songs, you have to really invest yourself in it. You have to put a lot of work into it because there's a lot of trial and error. It's Mm -hmm. very frustrating at first when you don't really know what you're doing. So, I mean, my answer would be, I mean, anybody can learn to write songs if, and it's a very big if, they have the what it takes to commit to learning it. And that is a lot. Yeah. And so I think that's what you were saying is, you know, if you want to write musicals, you have to know that you're getting into a huge thing that's extremely hard. It's, mm-hmm. And I agree, it's one of the most, because I, most of the time when I'm writing, I'm performing as well. So mm-hmm. I, I, I like, it's, it's like months where I'm writing all this music and then I'm performing and I'm in rehearsals and it is the most mentally and physically draining job I have ever had in my life. So yeah, no, don't get into this if you think that it's an easy way to get rich because 100%. you're not Lin-Manuel Miranda <laughs> and you know, uh, you're not, you it's, it's not easy, No, but it no, is not fantastic. All. Yes. I would agree with that. You got to have the passion for it and not just the passion for songwriting or, or music or musicals. You have to have a passion for the message that you're trying to say with it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's a great, great note to end on. So thanks so much for coming on. I really, we could talk for days. Yes, clearly. Uh, but especially uh, if we were talking yeah. about queen apparently <laughs> oh no well yeah. no, that's not Next time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for coming guys um and uh yeah everybody go listen to the podcast click the links it's uh what's the url again just one more um, time well for the sake of the argument we'll go with once in a lifetime podcast.com once or, in a lifetime podcast.com or you can go learn check more it out about today. us at linkamedia.com yeah awesome thank thanks you so much, guys. it was a pleasure see you later mm-hmm.